Hello and welcome to Lost Love Chronicles. The cell phone rang at a most inopportune time as I studied the project I was working on. I took it out of my pocket and did not recognize the number. Fearing that I would soon be subjected to a telephone solicitor, I answered the call. It was much worse. May I speak to Mark Mallon? The officious voice inquired. I assured the person that she was speaking to Mark Mallon. Please hold for Ms. Peterson, the voice ordered. Instead, I went ahead and terminated the call. As I suspected, within a minute, I received another call. Mr. Mallon, I'm sorry we were cut off. Please hold for Ms. Peterson. Again, I terminated the call. Once more, the phone began to ring and once again I answered. An exasperated tone came from my unknown caller. She began to explain how this scenario was supposed to work. I interrupted her mid-sentence. Please inform Ms. Peterson that I have no inclination to talk to her today or any other day. Again, I hung up and tried to focus on my work. Within five minutes, the phone began to ring again. I studied the number and recognized it from the previous two calls. I decided to let it go to voicemail. Soon the icon appeared that I had a message. I didn't feel any need to find out what the message was. By now I had decided on my course of action concerning my task and began placing the items in place. The telephone again interrupted the tranquility and I chose to turn the damn thing off. One of the first lessons I ever learned about power tools was to concentrate on what you were doing. Not only did it help maintain safety, but it also allowed the time to pass by quickly. Now I focused in placing the 2 by 4 by 10 feet pine boards into a vertical parallel pattern with 16 inches intervals between the studs. Then came the horizontal 2x4x tins, one on top, the other two on bottom. Using my measuring tape I determined it was square and went at each stud driving nails from the power hammer securing the studs into the frame. I stopped to examine my work and decided it was acceptable and lifted the frame upright and braced it against the unfinished basement wall. Leaning against the frame, I quickly found one of the pre-drilled holes I had made in the horizontal bottom board and grabbed the second air hammer and drove the long concrete nails all along the bottom. A quick cursory look with my level showed me it was okay, and then I went back to the first air hammer and quickly had the top braced. Another check to make sure it had remained squared, and I stepped back to observe the result. By itself, it didn't appear much in the stark, empty basement, but I had made the frame and had it up within 15 minutes. So at four frames an hour, I should be able to complete the entire framing this evening and be one step closer to completion. I was glad that the earlier projects of running the conduit lines and electrical wiring and the HVAC ductwork had worked out well. Thank God, the plumbing had already been installed, so that was one headache I wouldn't have to worry about. So this evening, I would finish the framing. Saturday, put up the insulation and paneling and Sunday, lay down the wood parquet tiles. That would certainly justify my weekend reward of the six-pack of beer icing down in my ice cooler. Hard to believe that in a few short weeks I would be able to check off the entire basement project. Hard to believe that I now limited my drinking to a single six-pack of beer per weekend. Two beers a day after all the daily tasks were completed. It hadn't been that long ago that a six-pack would serve as a warm-up for some serious drinking. Thanks to Ms. Peterson, Ms. Denise Screwing Peterson, Ms. Denise Screwing Ex-Wife Peterson. I shook my head at the animosity I felt for Denise now. How could a woman I was so totally committed in love with turn out to be such a witch? I forced myself to focus back onto my framing. The more I worked, the less time I would have to think, the sooner I would get through, so I could jump into a hot shower and then knock down the two long necks. Then off to bed, and if I was lucky, there would be no dreams. That was the crux of my existence nowadays. Find a way to stay busy that way there wouldn't be any time for the pain. It was a hell of a way to live but it beats dying every day, I thought. With that last final thought, I began preparing the boards for the second frame, and the third, and the fourth, and so on down the line. I staggered upstairs for my libations and for a hot shower before bed. When I woke up, I remembered to turn on my cell phone again. Twenty frigging calls and voicemail messages and all from the same source as yesterday. I dumped all the calls without bothering to listening to whatever demands Denise's secretary thought were necessary. As I dressed, I was cheered by the fact that I wouldn't be bothered for the weekend. I went to my computer and checked on a few pressing business situations. I sent out several emails on how to deal with the situations and went downstairs. A quick trip to the kitchen provided me with my bowl of Wheaties and I munched down my breakfast of champions. With a sigh, I trudged back downstairs to the basement and put on my mask and started installing the rolls of insulation to the frames. I had a portable radio tuned to a classic rock station, and so I whiled away the hours interspersing the songs with the noise of my labors and the occasional profanity slipping from me. 
By mid-afternoon, I had completed the installation and went upstairs to fix a sandwich. As I ate the turkey sandwich, I stared outside to the gloomy, rainy November day. It reminded me of another rainy November day from last year. I remembered how I stood drenched outside my in-law's house after I landed in Chicago on Thanksgiving morning. This would be a surprise visit as I certainly didn't get an invitation to attend from either my wife or children or my parents-in-laws. When the door swung open, I saw the surprised look on my brother-in-law's face. Before he could come up with some lame excuse, I managed to walk by him into the happy bustle in the house. My appearance brought an instant silence to the joyous occasion. My 14-year-old son, Brian, looked down at the floor. Susan, my 17-year-old daughter, hurriedly excused herself from the room. My wife, Denise, extracted herself from the lap of the stranger who was holding her so familiarly. Even in her shame, she sought to mitigate the damage by introducing me to Paul Starling. The stranger arose out of the chair and held out his hand for me to shake. I just stood there and stared at him until he finally dropped his hand. Meanwhile, my dear mother-in-law scurried into the room to assist in making sure nothing dramatic would happen. I thought, at least I was getting her carpet wet as the raindrops continued to drip off my trench coat. Why, Mark, we were not expecting you. When did you arrive? I heard the witch say. I ignored her as I tried to catch my wife's face, but she apparently found something very interesting on her mother's wall and would not turn and face me. I went back to the front door and walked outside and pulled out my cell phone and called the taxi service. With any luck, I could catch the cab that had dropped me off before he got too far away. No one from inside the house came out to persuade me to stay. I sighed as the painful memory came to an end. I went back down to the basement to begin installing the sheets of paneling. The job went by quickly as the sheets, while bulky, also covered a large area as I used the paneling nails to drive into the studs with my claw hammer. Lucky for me, the paneling that had cutouts for electrical wall outlets and heating and air vents all fitted perfectly. Now, I could use the heating unit, but I found out that I quickly worked up a sweat so there wasn't much of a need for heat. I was pleased that I had planned so carefully as I only had a few boards and a couple of sheets of spare paneling left over. I carried them to the garage and stowed them away until I had a chance to get them into the workshop. I installed the electrical outlets and completed the wiring sequence for each one. Since I used the traditional color coding, there was no way to mess up a ground wire to a hot wire. Then hooking up the system to a circuit breaker into the breaker box, I determined that I had power to each new outlet and adequate circulation to the HVAC system. In the great scheme of things, it wasn't that big a deal, but I screwed in the outlet's covers and the duct's covers. Then I swept down the floor several times with the shop vac to get the floor ready for the adhesive I would be applying in the morning. But now I had a shower calling for me. The hot water soothed the aching muscles and I luxuriated in the steamy water. What a contrast to the bone-chilling cold I felt going back to O'Hare Airport that passed Thanksgiving. I was numb physically and mentally as I negotiated for a ticket back home. Damn the cost. I knew my marriage was dead. I just didn't know when the funeral would take place. I toweled off and decided to go on to bed. Tomorrow would be another long and hopefully rewarding day. Almost immediately I went asleep. Sunday morning I woke to the sound of a thunderstorm brewing outside. I slipped on my Levi's and work boots and t-shirt and trudged downstairs. I only hope we wouldn't lose power during the day. I turned the radio to a sports station so I could catch the game. I began to liberally apply the adhesive to the basement floor and smoothed it even throughout the entire surface area. I had considered making a custom oak parquet floor for the basement, but decided it would not be cost efficient. So I had boxes of pre-made parquet tiles waiting by the stairs. I waited for the adhesive to set for its optimal time before starting to set the tiles down. I went back upstairs and mentally took notes on how to proceed for the next big project, sanding down the floors and staining and varnishing them in the most expedient manner. I made a list of the tools I would have to rent, a floor sander, and a floor buffer were the two most important. The other tools, small sanders, pry bars, hammers, brushes, rollers I already had in the workshop. I would have to be extra careful not to crack or break the vintage baseboards or the moldings. I would also have to catalog each individual piece so I would be able to fit each piece to the room it belonged in. I went into the kitchen and brewed up a pot of coffee. I looked around the improved kitchen I had finished a month ago. Bright fluorescent light lit up the entire kitchen area. The new state of the art appliances sparkled. I sat in the breakfast nook adjacent to the new food preparation island I had built. The new Mexican glaze tiles added a colorful atmosphere to the island. 
All I had to do was to knock out a non-load bearing wall to a room that was previously a small servant dining area to vastly extend the entire kitchen. Even expanding the shelves and the pantry still made the room too big. I finally built in a brick pizza oven that set off the final touch to the kitchen. The thought of pizza brought to mind how I had met Denise and I drifted off back in time. It was at a freshman mixer at a local pizza parlor at my university. I really didn't want to go, but my roommate insisted. I stood there nursing down my illicit underage beer when I saw a tall brunette nearby. She was athletic looking, long muscular legs and an amazing body. And she was being harassed by some drunken loud. I couldn't hear what he said, but whatever it was earned him a slap across his face. Before he could react I intervened and was between them so he could not assault her. That did not deter his rage as he tried to get to her. I managed to remain between them as he jostled me every way he could think of. Finally the bouncers showed up and escorted the guy out. I turned around and stared right into the loveliest set of green eyes I think I've ever seen. She introduced herself as Denise and I told her I was Mark. We sat and talked for a while then she excused herself and I thought I would never see her again. A month later I was walking across campus and I heard someone yelling at me. This crazed female dressed in a raggedy and get up with Greek letters emblazed across the bib ran up to me. Hi, do you have a condom? The stunned look on my face led her to explain that she was pledging a sorority and needed to get a condom from a student on campus to complete her last task before getting accepted. I could only nod and blush as I opened my wallet and handed her the Trojan I had kept since I was in the ninth grade. She screamed in delight and grabbed it and ran off to her sorority house. I just watched as that lovely body disappeared from view. Another month passed, and the campus prepared for homecoming. I was walking back to my dorm when this person started walking besides me. I looked and tried to recognize where I had seen this girl before. Hi, are you ready to rescue me for the third time? I responded, I beg your pardon? She stopped, and that forced me to stop, and she repeated, Are you ready to rescue me for the third time? You saved me at the pizza parlor and when I needed to pledge my sorority. Now, I need you to save me again. Puzzled, I asked, how am I supposed to rescue you? She explained, I'm supposed to go to homecoming with a guy from our brother fraternity, but the guy is a real jackass. The only way I can get out of going is to have a date with someone else. I sarcastically said, well, that works wonders for my ego. How could I refuse such a gracious offer? I don't think she realized that I was putting her on. She told me what sorority house she lived at and what time to be there. I walked off wondering what the hell had just happened. I went back to my room and told my roommate what had transpired. He urged me to go on the date since otherwise I would just spend the evening like every other Saturday night studying. He reached in his desk drawer and pulled out a condom and told me I might just get lucky. In fact, I did not get lucky. I did spend the entire date getting acquainted with Denise as we both ignored our inept football team and conversed throughout the game. After we left the stadium, we decided to go to a small coffee house to continue our talk. We were so animated that before we knew it, they were closing the place down. We walked back to her house, and I stalled trying to decide whether to try for a kiss. Denise decided for me as she told me good night and walked away without even a peck on the cheek. I took that to mean that I didn't really make the grade as I walked back to my room. When I got in, my roommate was gone. I had grown accustomed to not expecting him to appear back before Sunday evening. I laid on my bed and fell asleep thinking of those green eyes. All next month, I tried to call Denise only to be told she was unavailable. Word got back to me that she had started dating some other fellow. I was sad that I had lost out before I even had a chance to get into the game. A clap of thunder shook me out of my reverie of Denise and I went back to the basement and laying down the tiles and the tongue and groove set on the sides of the tiles. I halfway listened to the game and only stopped to go retrieve a new box of tiles. When I got to the end of the floor, I stood and looked at the floor and was pleased as how they complimented the paneling. Not wanting to stop, I nailed down the miter baseboards and voila, it was finished. Now, all I had to do was to install the track lighting and the crown molding and it would be done except for decorating the basement. But that was for another day. Today, I would celebrate. The business week would start in the morning and I would be able to focus solely on making money during those hours. Perhaps in the evenings I would complete some piddling little jobs around the house that weren't worthy of wasting a weekend on. Then on Friday, the cycle would repeat as I continued to stay busy working on the house. That Friday, I went to the Home Depot and picked up the rented floor sander and buffer in my work pickup truck. I also purchased enough coarse, medium, and fine-grade sandpaper pads to complete both floors of my house. Throughout the week, I had spent the evenings carefully prying up the molding and baseboards through all the rooms. 
I had cataloged each piece and had already sanded them down. All I would have to do would be to sand down the areas using the sander. Since the baseboard and molding would conceal the area close to the walls, I wouldn't have to sand exactly to the walls. My phone rang and I looked at yet another call from Denise's office. Sporadically through the past week, I had received calls from her. So much so, I finally put the number on speed dial so I could instantly recognize it. That got me thinking of a Friday phone call a long time ago. I was studying when the dorm phone rang. I figured it was for my roommate since he was the only one to get calls, but he had already left. So I answered and was ready to take a message for him. Where the hell are you? The voice screamed at me. Taken aback, I said, who is this? What do you mean? Who is this? This is Denise. Now where the hell are you? Pissed off, I said. Well, you called me. Where the hell do you think I am? Look, just get over here, pronto. I debated not going, but the enticement of seeing her was too persuasive, so I wound up at her sorority house. I gave my name and waited. Soon I saw Denise in the hallway apparently arguing with some guy. The conversation was quite animated as she pointed at me, which earned a look of loathing from the guy. She stormed outside and said, we got to go, and started leading me away. After a distance I stopped and said, can you tell me what the hell this is about? She looked angrily at me and said, that fraternity creep was bothering me again. And, how is that my fault? I asked. I needed help, she yelled. Why didn't you call your boyfriend? I turned and walked away. I wound up back at the coffee house where we had went on our homecoming date. She came in and sat down beside me. She started talking and before I knew it I was over being pissed off. Then she told me she wanted to see me, but with one small caveat. Look, I'm attracted to you, but I'm not ready to be tied down to one guy. So, I want to date you as well as others, and if this is meant to be then we will both know it. Can you handle that? I wasn't too thrilled with the idea of sharing her with anyone. Then she leaned over and kissed me and I knew I was a lost soul even then. Some weekends, I was lucky enough to get a date with her and other weekends I would languish back in my room torturing myself with the thoughts of her with someone else. After four months, I finally had sex with her in her car and I was even more smitten. Try as I could to convince her, she still refused to stop dating others. That convoluted merry-go-round went on for the next two years until one day she came up to me. I'm pregnant. The earth stood still. She continued to look at me and said it was mine, and I knew what she expected me to do. Mentally, I was screaming inside. I had one more year to get my BA in business, then I would go and get my MBA and go collect a large salary. Then I would be in a position to propose to Denise. Now was way too soon. Denise's plan was to get her degree in history and apply to law school. That meant three more years for her as well. Now all of a sudden plans would have to change. We started talking and came up with a solution. We would have a quiet wedding, I would go out to work and support her through law school. When she got a job, she would support me while I got my MBA. Then we would live happily ever after. That was when the shit hit the fan. I met her mother, also known as the Evil Witch of the North. She screamed at me for ruining her daughter's life from day one, and she never let up on me since then. My grandmother, who had raised me, also had reservations about the marriage, but limited it to insisting that her house, which I would eventually inherit, be protected by a prenuptial agreement. Denise was pissed about that, but my grandmother insisted, and she finally signed off on that. We had our quiet shotgun wedding and began living together. That last year in school was rough with Denise's pregnancy and me trying to support us with any number of odd jobs that came along. I mowed yards, I did small home repairs, I did contract labor, nothing was too low as long as it brought money to the table. Somehow we made it through with us both graduating. Denise gave birth to our daughter, Susan, and Denise was accepted into law school. Denise's mom flooded her house with graduation pictures and pictures of the baby. I wasn't included in any of them. I had lucked into a stock brokerage internship which meant I basically did all the shitty jobs that none of the brokers would do. But I persevered from doing cold calls to going out to get lunch deliveries. By persevering, I wound up getting my broker's license and began trading stocks under the supervision of a senior broker as my expertise grew. So did my salary. I started to notice despite every promotion we were still unable to save any money as Denise would find new opportunities to spend every dime I got. Then came her third year in law school and she announced she was pregnant once again. Eight months later our son, Brian, was born. Now I was responsible for caring for a newborn, a three-year-old toddler, and a wife focusing on law school finals and then taking the bar. The times were countless that I held my temper as Denise or her mother would gripe about something. Still I knew how important it was for Denise to realize her dream 
so I sucked it up and continued to try to be her support as she spent time with her study group. A couple of times I would briefly join them when they went a blow off steam at some bar. I would leave early so I could tend to the babies and allow Denise some me time. My goals didn't match the approval of some of the testosterone-driven male study partners as they would ridicule me in front of Denise. I was ready to beat the ever-loving shit out of them, but I knew that would impact negatively on Denise. So I swallowed my pride and pretended that I didn't hear or realize I was the butt of their jokes. Finally, the day arrived that finals were over and my Denise wound up being number three in her class. I felt pride as she marched across the stage at graduation while I held our children. She was glowing as she introduced me to countless classmates and then left me to attend a graduation party. She didn't come home till 10 the next morning explaining that she had crashed at her friend's house after she had over-imbibed. I argued with her that she should have called me to pick her up. That led to much yelling which in turn caused our children to start crying. Which meant I spent the next couple of hours calming our children. Then I decided to let it slide since the damage was already done and why upset the children again. If I thought law school was intense, then studying for the bar was sheer unadulterated hell. Denise and her study partners eat, lived, breathed the law 24-7 for four months preparing for the three-day ordeal. Again, I did what I could to support her from foot massages to going on midnight ice cream runs. Denise came through in flying colors as she had the top grade on the bar exam. Denise had no trouble landing a high-paying corporate job in Dallas. So we moved and I thought I would start my MBA at SMU. I was quickly informed that I would have to put that idea on hold. Denise argued that we needed to start out with as much money as we could while she worked to make partner in her firm. She said if I could hold off till then she would support me in getting my MBA. She convinced me it was necessary for us to have a two-income family so we could start our nest egg. So I found a brokerage firm in Dallas and began working for them. I soon found out that Denise subscribed to the Joseph Stalin philosophy that what was hers was hers. What was mine was negotiable. I was responsible for paying the rent, our cars, the household budget, our student loans, and every other expense under the sun. Denise was responsible for Denise and every attempt I made to account for her salary resulted in a screaming tirade by her. I never found out where her salary went. We stayed a decade in Dallas before corporate headquarters transferred Denise to Atlanta. I suggested to Denise that we fix up my grandmother's house that I did inherit after she died. Denise refused that idea claiming the dilapidated house looked like the Adams family mansion. I explained to her that the Victorian mansion could easily be fixed to her satisfaction for the amount she wanted to spend. I think a lot of it was she still felt insulted by my grandmother's demand for a prenuptial. Instead, Denise found a house with an expensive price tag and a repressive homeowners association. I begged her to reconsider but she had her mind made up. So against my wish, I found myself signing paperwork to purchase a house I didn't like, in a neighborhood I didn't like, paying the required dues to a country club I didn't like. Once again, I changed jobs in a brokerage firm where I was low man on the totem pole. I continued to scrap by barely able to cover our expenses from month to month. The friction was causing stress in our marriage as she began to denigrate me in front of the children. The final straw was when the house started breaking down and the homeowners association insisted on me making expensive repairs that I could not cover. I dreaded going to Denise, but I was on the razor's edge. My last job review stated I had reached my plateau in earning capacity. In other words, I was stuck in my job with no hope of advancement. I sat down with Denise and once again tried to explain our precarious situation. I showed her my copy of my job review even though it shamed me. Again, she sneered at me declaring her mother had been right about me all along. I sat defeated at the table as she got up and left. The next day, she told me she had a solution. Her company needed someone to go to their Chicago office and run it until further notice. The scuttlebutt was that whoever got the assignment was the favorite to be the next partner in the law firm. She and the children would go stay with her mom, while I remained down here to clean up the mess I made. Even I could manage to do something right if I had a head start. I held back from unleashing on her. I was sad to see the children weren't overly upset with the notion that we would be separated from me. Mostly, they seemed excited on the prospect of moving to Chicago to be spoiled by their grandmother. For me, the departure at the airport broke my heart, but the three of them were eager to leave. I went back home and cried. The next day, I made an appointment with the Homeowners Association board to discuss my plan to repair the house to their standards. They rejected my plan outright and placed a series of draconian terms I would be forced to comply with. I would have to sacrifice to make everything work. 
Even with the temporary relief from my family leaving, I was still just managing to tread water financially. I began with the simple jobs that didn't take much knowledge or skills and completed them first, then I would start on the more complex jobs. It seemed for every job I completed, two new ones would erupt, and I began to despise the money pit I lived in. I could only occasionally get my family on the phone, and when I did, they would terminate the call as quickly as they could. I began to drink heavily. That was frowned upon at my office, but by this time, I didn't give a damn. The months passed by until the winter holidays got close. I called to ask Denise to come home so I could be with my family. She told me that wasn't possible due to her work schedule. Then I suggested my flying up there. She told me my priority was to fix the house, not spend money for a vacation. Besides, Denise intimated that her family would be away for Thanksgiving, so there was no need to come up. She handed the phone off to Susan, who told me that the family was gathering at her grandmother's, and she was so excited to see her cousins. Then Brian got on the phone and told me that his uncle was taking him to the Bears game at Soldier Field on Thanksgiving. Something wasn't adding up, and I finally had my fill of the situation. I decided that I would go to Chicago. I certainly found the answers to questions I never thought of before such as how easily I was replaced. The worst answer was when Susan turned 18. I had tried in vain to contact her and Brian after my trip to Chicago a number of times leaving countless voice messages begging them to call me. They never did return my calls. Two weeks after Susan's birthday, I got a large manila envelope in the mail. Susan had filed in Cook County to change her name from Susan and Mallon to Susan and Starling. Her reasoning was she wanted the name of her biological father, Paul L. Starling. Attached were affidavits from Susan Mallon and Paul Starling, which alleged they had began an intimate relationship in college through law school, which resulted in the birth of their daughter. This was confirmed by the notarized DNA results from three reputable labs. Included was the file-stamped copy of the judge's order granting the name change. Right then I knew that when Brian turned 18, I would get a similar surprise. Then I got the call from Denise. She asked if I had received a package in the mail, and I told her I had. She explained that copy was supposed to go to her mother, but due to a secretary's mistake it had been addressed to me. She assured me that the secretary had been terminated for making the mistake. No, Denise. I'm the one that's been making mistakes. The problem is I've been making them for more than 20 years. I hung up the phone and soon after that I got served the divorce papers. Despite her having the higher paying job, she insisted that I was not entitled to an equitable division of the marital assets. What was hers was hers and what was mine was mine except for that money pit called a house. Even though she never paid a penny on the house, she expected to get 50% of that asset when it was sold. In other words, I would be out $400,000. I wonder how she reacted when she immediately received back the draconian property settlement agreement with my signature attached with no protest. I took time to refocus on the floors and realized that I went on autopilot and the floors were sanded and buffed and ready for staining and varnishing. I was proud of the progress that I was making and tomorrow would see the stain job completed in midweek, I would start adding the several coats of varnish to protect the stain. The stain I had selected would look good against the different hues of pastel that I painted the various rooms. I twisted off the cap of the first long neck of the day and wandered around all the rooms discovering minor things that still needed to be addressed, but all were simple things that could be done easily. What I needed was another big project to take up time and I continued to look around weighing options. I found myself out on the master bedroom balcony looking out at the sprawling backyard. Suddenly it came to me. A large swimming pool with an adjoining hot tub, perhaps a pool house. I smiled at the research I would have to do and what permits I would have to apply for. With any luck the backyard project would take the entire summer. I visualized different sizes and styles of pools and guessed at the prospective costs of the project. Soon I started hearing the sound of a tortured motor and people yelling. Since they weren't visible from the back, I went to a bedroom facing the front street. I looked down to see a large U-Haul rental truck with a U-Haul trailer attached to it trying to back into the drive of the house next door. The driver was having a hard time trying to figure out what to do and had gotten the trailer jackknifed into the rain-sodden yard, and now they were just spinning the wheels deeper into the lawn. I hurried outside and tapped on the driver's window, startling the driver. She turned and looked at me in surprise. Even as harried as she was trying to correct her problem and dealing with two young children in the passenger seat yelling she was knocked down gorgeous. And she was crying. I asked her if she needed help and the look of relief warmed my heart as she tearfully nodded. I opened the door and gave her my umbrella. She scurried over to the passenger's door and unbuckled the children and led them to the cover provided by the front porch. 
I got into the driver's seat and straightened out the wheels and put it into low gear. I eased on the gas pedal so the rear wheels wouldn't spin and slowly inched forward to get out of the rut she had dug. To do that I had to track up more of her front yard, but it was the easiest solution. Soon I had the truck and trailer back on the street ready for another attempt. Most people have never had to drive a vehicle hauling a trailer. The secret to reversing with a trailer is you have to turn opposite the way you would normally reverse. So slowly, I negotiated the trailer up the drive until both the trailer and truck were in the drive ready to be unloaded. I turned off the vehicle and ran hunched over from the rain onto the porch. The kids were applauding and a big grin was now on the blonde angel. I decided then and there that I enjoyed her more grinning than crying. Here's the keys. I handed over to her and placed them in her small palm. Thank you so much for helping us. I don't know what I was going to do. Damn, she even had the sweetest southern drawl possible. Always glad to help out a neighbor. I'm Mark Mallon. I'm assuming you are my new neighbors? Oh, forgive my rudeness. I'm Jeannie Harris and these two monsters are Kay and Billy. The description brought on a stream of protest from the children and they ran to clutch their mother to make her stop. I grinned at the shenanigans as the crisis was now past and all could relax. I told her, I hope you have help coming to unload because I could tell the truck and trailer are really weighed down. A look of sadness came on her face. No, I had help loading, but it is just going to be us three unloading. Here, let me help and if it gets too bad I can call some people over. I was rewarded with another look of gratitude as she profusely thanked me. I suggested I would do what unloading I could by myself, and then we would figure out things. The three disappeared into their house. Cries of disappointment erupted from the house immediately. I went inside to the darkened room. Jeannie was upset as she told me the power was supposed to be on. I told her to hold on and went outside to call a buddy that worked for the power company. I told him the address and he said he remembered he had caught that particular job for installing the meter. But no one was home, so under company policy he had left. He was scheduled to return Monday afternoon to try again. Well, they're here now, and it is a lady with two small kids, and you owe me some favors. So get over here, install the meter, and then get creative with the paperwork. He agreed to come out, and I hung up and walked to Jeannie and told her the power would be on soon. She thanked me, and again the kids burst into applause. With that I unlocked the trailer and began hauling boxes into what area was dimly lit by the rainy daylight atmosphere of the front room. Jeannie helped carry the smaller, lighter boxes into the house as the two children watched from the porch. They were so cute as they argued over who would get to sleep in their room first. Jeannie just gave me a sardonic grin as she noticed me observing the children. I reminded her to leave the heavy boxes to me as I took a large box from her and carried it to the stack of boxes inside. Just as we were finishing unloading the trailer, my friend John drove up in his company utility truck. In a few minutes, lights came on throughout the house. This energized the kids as they began to run from room to room exploring. John went back to his truck to get the paperwork for Jeannie to sign. So Mark, you got everything unloaded? I replied, John, we're still working on the trailer and hadn't started on the truck yet. Without saying anything else, John walked to the trailer and picked up a box and started carrying it inside. That gave me the idea to make several calls and I told Jeannie and John to take a break. We sat there getting acquainted and Jeannie told us that she was an elementary school teacher. Before I could get around to asking her how she could afford a house in the neighborhood, the Calvary arrived. Friends with wives and kids started arriving bringing pizzas, beer for the adults, and sodas for the kids, but most important they brought strong backs. A whirlwind of activity ensued as the truck got unloaded. My friends' wives were given a tour of the house, an army of kids were chasing each other throughout the house and decorating strategy was discussed nonstop. Boxes were opened and contents taken to the proper rooms. Furniture was unloaded and bedroom sets were assembled in the proper rooms. Then the living room was decorated to signal the end of the unloading of the truck. Then it was a matter of just relaxing and enjoying a visit with friends. I was impressed how easily Jeannie adapted to hosting an impromptu party of people she just met. Then I realized that her warm manners was quickly making her friends as phone numbers were shared and lunch dates were made among all the women. John leaned toward me and nudged me with his beer bottle and whispered, You know, the common denominator between all these ladies is you. Get ready for your ears to be burning. I laughed and then told him about my idea for a pool. We started throwing out ideas and more of the guys started chiming in opinions. So there I was with the guys talking and Jeannie talking to the girls and every now and then, we would steal a glance at each other and smile. Slowly, the party broke up and all the guests had left. 
Jeannie allowed me to carry the slumbering kids upstairs to their beds, and she tucked them in and kissed her sleeping angels goodnight. Wordlessly, we went downstairs and then outside to sit on the front steps. I offered her a beer and she shook her head no. So I twisted the cap off the icy long neck and took a deep swallow. We continued just to sit relaxing. Mark, you are my hero. Thank you so much for all you've done for us. Jeannie, I'm just being neighborly. There's no need to thank me. Nonsense, she insisted. If it wasn't for you, I'd still be stuck in my front yard with two crying kids in a house without power. I owe you big time, mister. I laughed and said, wait till you get to know me. And I took another swig. Speaking of the truck, what are you going to do with that? An anguished look appeared on Jeannie's face and she related the horror story of driving cross-country in the truck. How she had countless irate drivers honk at her when she was forced to stop for gas, food, or potty breaks. Her unfamiliarity with driving a truck had caused a number of traffic jams at gas stations, fast food places, and motels. Usually, she would suffer humiliations and profanities hurled at her until somehow she would solve her dilemma. And now I have to return the truck cross-country. She cried as she explained the U-Haul store insisted she return the truck to their location. I placed my hand on her shoulder and placated her. Jeannie, I'll take care of taking the truck back to them. She looked at me in shock. Mark, I can't let you do that. Jeannie, you can't subject your kids to another trip like that. I can take care of this. Don't worry about the truck. It's not like I'm going to steal it and you know where I live. She continued to argue for another couple of hours until my logic finally won out and she gave me all the rental papers. She asked when I would start to leave on my trip. I told her it would be around 9 a.m. She said if I was leaving that early, maybe we ought to call it a night. As we stood up, she gave me an impulsive hug and kissed me on the cheek goodnight. She was inside before I could even react. I had a warm glow as I walked home. The next morning, I knocked on Jeannie's door. As she opened it, I was beset with twin typhoons hugging my legs, calling me Mr. Mark. I laughed and picked them both up and carried them inside. Jeannie nervously handed me the keys and an envelope full of $20 dollar bills. She explained it was for gas money and a bus ticket to get back home. Mark, please be careful. She told me as I fired up the truck and backed the trailer and trucked down the drive. When will you be back? She asked. I smiled. Sooner than you think. I drove toward the interstate and right before I got to the on-ramp, I turned into the local U-Haul store. I walked inside and saw the person I wanted to deal with. Hi, Mark. What's up? As the store manager shook my hand. Hi, Perry. I'm returning a truck for a friend. I handed him the paperwork and he studied it. Mark, this says this was supposed to be a round-trip rental. The truck and trailer are due to be back there. Well, Perry, things have changed and this needs to be a one-way rental and I'll pay whatever extra is due for changing the terms. Okay, let me clear this with the originating store. While I waited, I noticed Perry engaged in an escalating conversation with the party on the other end. Finally, he yelled he would damn well accept delivery of the trailer and truck and slammed the phone down. As he walked to me, he said, Not a word from you, Mark. I just smiled and handed him the keys as he inspected the truck and then a credit card to cover the change from a round-trip rental to a one-way. He handed me a receipt and I violated his order and thanked him. Then I went outside and called a taxi. Thirty minutes later found me getting out of the cab in front of my house. As luck would have it, Kay and Billy were playing outside once they saw me cries of Mr. Mark filled the air. A grimy genie came outside to investigate her eyes widened in surprise to see me. What happened? Please don't tell me you had an accident. I laughed and told her I was back from dropping off the truck and trailer at the local U-Haul store. She frowned, but back home they told me when I rented the truck, I had to contract it for a round trip. They weren't going to let me have it unless I returned it. Genie, when I talked to the local U-Haul manager, he called them and explained the change in circumstances and got them to agree to allow him to accept the delivery of the truck. Okay, it was a lie, but it didn't hurt anyone except the jackasses that rented the truck and it solved the problem. At any rate, Jeannie smiled as I gave her the receipt which signified the transaction was complete. Looks like you're having fun, as I indicated the dirty garb she had on. She told me that she was underestimating the complexities the house was presenting. I told her if it got too bad to come over and get me and I'd help her out. I then gave back to her the envelope of cash she had given me that morning and walked back to my house. Despite losing half the morning, I soon had the entire second floor stain applied and started on the first floor. The therapeutic release that activity gave me was now being counterbalanced by thinking of the enticing blonde next door. I realized that I was humming as I applied the stain. It had been a long time since I ever felt like humming. 
A knock on the door brought an end to my humming, and I opened the door to an anxious genie. I have a plumbing emergency. There's water leaking under my toilet. Can you help me? Let me grab some tools and I'll be right over. Genie. I quickly gathered up all the tools I suspected I would need and went next door. Kay and Billy were waiting for me at the door and shouted the arrival of Mr. Mark to the world. They led me upstairs to the master bedroom where I found Jeannie in the bathroom wiping up water furiously with a towel in hand wringing it into the sink. Setting my tools down, I knelt down and turned the water off at the valve. I then flushed the commode to empty the tank and bowl. That brought another flood of water to leak out of the toilet. I told Jeannie that I would handle it from here. She moved away and tried to remove the bra and panties hanging from the shower rod without me noticing. I pretended not to see her doing it as she walked behind me and stood in the doorway. From practice, I quickly had the tank disconnected from the water line and removed from the bowl. Then the bowl was off, and as I suspected the wax ring had failed. I removed the remnants of the old wax ring and replaced it with a spare ring I had from my own renovations. All the while I was explaining what I was doing to Jeannie. I cocked around the lip of the bottom of the bowl and carefully placed the bowl on top of the flange. I pressed down on the bowl and told Jeannie to come sit down on the toilet lid. She giggled as I told her that her weight would assure that the wax ring would seal properly. As I moved around her screwing the bolts to the flange screws, I got the crazy idea of screwing her. Even after I was sure the ring had sealed, I kept her sitting there despite the awkward positions I had to undergo. Finally, I had to tell her to get up so I could reattach the tank. Soon it was bolted on and I turned the water back on and did a test flush. There was no rush of water this time and Jeannie gave a yell of victory. I then finished with another bead of caulking around the bottom of the bowl. After that it was just a matter of mopping and cleaning up. She moved to hug me but I indicated my sodden clothes. Well, let me wash them, she cried. I reminded her I would be running around naked and she blushed. She said she would like to treat me to a meal, but without her car she hadn't had a chance to shop for groceries. She and the kids would be surviving on delivery establishments. I told her, if she liked, I would go home and shower and take them out for supper. She was concerned that they were imposing on me too much. I told her not to think any such thing and I would be there at 6 p.m. to take them out. Come 6 p.m., I pulled in their garage and they came out to the car. Jeannie expressed surprise that I had gone and bought two children booster seats for Kay and Billy. We got the kids situated and I took them to a nice Italian restaurant. I continued to get acquainted with my new neighbors as Kay and Billy took turns telling me things. Jeannie just sat and smiled as her two darlings continued to ingrain themselves into my heart. A couple of times they divulged some personal information which caused Jeannie to blush and quickly steer the conversation into another direction. After the meal I took them for ice cream at a place that had a children's play area. We watched as they romped with the other kids playing. The sheer look of love on Jeannie's face as she watched her children was the look that artists have tried to capture since the dawn of civilization. She noticed my staring at her and diverted her attention back to me. So, you like me, Jeannie Harris. I teased her. She immediately blushed, my God, I wanted to sink in the earth when Kay blurted that out. From that point, our conversation segued into a number of topics, including why Jeannie didn't have her car. She explained, her brother, who was an engineer, would be returning from duty overseas and he would be driving her car to them. Until then they would be renting a car starting tomorrow. Nonsense, just borrow mine, I said. I rarely drive it anyway since I'm usually in my truck. And again, we argued until I finally convinced her that by borrowing my car was the cheapest, expedient solution to her problem. When we started home the kids drifted to sleep almost immediately worn out from their exertions. On the way, I pointed out the various controls and features of the car to Jeannie as she quietly took it all in. I parked in her drive and gathered Kay in my arms as Jeannie unlocked the house. I put her on the bed and Jeannie went a-tucking her in. I went and got Billy and Jeannie was waiting as I put him to bed. Once again she fussed over him and I realized that I missed that part of raising a family. The sadness must have been showing because Jeannie had a worried look on her face as she looked at me. I tried to assure her that I was okay, but... I think she knew different. As I placed my car keys in her hand, she gently touched my cheek with her other hand and raising up on tiptoes gave me a soft goodnight kiss. I couldn't be sure, but I think I levitated all the way back to my home. Monday found me back at my job but I couldn't concentrate because of thinking of Jeannie. I turned off my computer and began doing any number of odd jobs around the house including finishing the staining of the first floor. So in that way it was a good day as the number of house projects continued to dwindle. It wasn't that I could see the light at the end of the tunnel, but 
I was quickly approaching the tunnel, nonetheless. I heard voices calling for Mr. Mark before the knock on the door. I grinned as I opened the door. Mr. Mark, come eat with us. The two kids chimed as Jeannie invited me to partake of their first home-cooked meal. I asked for 15 minutes for a quick shower, and she said they would be waiting. When I arrived, the dining room table was filled with fried chicken, southern fried potatoes, biscuits and gravy, corn, and black-eyed peas. The scent of a warm apple pie also announced its presence. Both kids argued they wanted to sit by me and Jeannie said the only way to solve that was for me to sit at the head of the table. The kids sat on either side of me and Jeannie sat opposite me. The kids said grace and then we all buried ourselves in the meal. I stuffed myself with the fabulous food and groaned as a slice of apple pie a la mode appeared before me. Somehow, I finished off every delicious morsel and then I was drafted to play a number of children games for the rest of the evening. 9 p.m. came and the children trudged off to bed with Jeannie following them. Halfway up, she stopped and invited me upstairs. I went up and read a bedtime story to Billy, while Jeannie did the same for Kay. As they slept, we sneaked downstairs and Jeannie put on a pot of coffee. As it brewed, we both began to clean up from the meal and soon had everything in order. She poured a large ceramic mug full for me and asked how I took it. When I told her black, she wrinkled her nose as she poured cream into hers. She handed me the mug and we walked outside to the porch swing. It was an unseasonably agreeable November night as we sipped the steaming coffee. We started talking about Kay and Billy and before I knew it, I was telling her about Susan and Brian. Then the floodgates spilled open as I told her about the flaming wreck my family and my life was. When I finished, Jeannie's eyes pooled with tears of sympathy for me and she placed her head on my torso and began consoling me. It was pleasant to have someone that had empathy for what I had been going through. Then in a quiet, soft voice, she told me what brought her and the children cross-country. She had lived the ideal childhood, was the homecoming queen and married her childhood boyfriend. They went off to college and got their degrees and then began to raise their family. Somewhere along the line, the train had run off the tracks. They began to argue mostly about his flirtations with other women. The flirtations escalated to full-blown affairs and the arguments became physical. Luckily, the children were too young to understand the drama that was unfolding. The D word figured more and more into Jeannie and her husband's conversations when they were talking to one another. Then came the fateful call one night from the police. A young woman driver had been killed in a one-car accident. Thrown out of the wreckage was her deceased husband. From all indications, they were involved in a sexual act at the time of the accident. From that point was the hellish existence of dealing with the situation. Her in-laws blamed Jeannie. The dead girl's family blamed Jeannie, and to a certain point, Jeannie blamed Jeannie. The estate slowly moved through probate as the in-law's legal maneuvers continued to eat into her late husband's assets. Then, the family of the dead girl filed a lawsuit and Jeannie was forced to countersue. Somehow she waded through the gauntlet, and when all the dust was settled she decided for a clean break. She had researched all regions of the country to relocate and karma had led her to my neighborhood. She had used all her money to purchase her house, and now all she had left was the promise of a job in the school district and an underperforming hedge fund account that she would be forced to dip into to cover her expenditures until she started her job. One thing she hadn't counted on were the house repairs that needed to be done, that was also eating away at her savings. Through it all, she still had no regrets for moving here. We sat there silently contemplating as the swing slowly swept back and forth. Then I told her I wanted to look at her hedge fund account. I told her I was sure that I could get her stock portfolio back onto a successful track. She got up and went inside the house. A few minutes later, she returned carrying a file. I took the papers and told her I would look at them overnight. She told me to keep them and bring them back over tomorrow night when we sat down for supper. Then she gave me another goodnight kiss. As soon as I got home, I started studying her hedge fund account and became aware of all the unethical ways the manager used to enrich himself. Not only was he a crook, but he was an incompetent one based on his selection of stocks to invest in. I had no doubt that I could affect a 30% positive change in her account in the first year alone. I began to redline things to point out to Jeannie tomorrow and went to bed still thinking about her kiss. Supper time found me at Jeannie's for another tasty meal, followed by more children games and bedtime readings. This time I read Kay to sleep and tucked her in and told her good night. The night was colder and precluded being outside, and I would need the use of the table anyway to spread out my analysis, spreadsheets, and projections for Jeannie. I had it all laid out as she came downstairs and made another pot of coffee. She asked me what I found out. I told her that she was being cheated and that I could help her. As I began to explain in detail, she started walking into the den. 
I asked her what was wrong. She replied nothing was wrong. That she trusted me and therefore there was no reason for me to explain things. Now she wanted me to come into the din and relax. I followed her in and we sat and talked into the night as the fire died out in the fireplace. I realized despite the age difference that in the short time I knew Jeannie I was so much more comfortable with her than I had been with Denise as we kissed goodnight. I left with her signature to authorize me taking over her stock account and a standing invitation to supper. As soon as I woke up I began to get Jeannie's financial situation stabilized. I called her former broker and told him that he was fired and I was now handling the account. He started getting disagreeable until I mentioned that perhaps I needed to make a call to the SEC. Those magic words brought an entire change in attitude and I got him to agree to reimburse Jeannie every fee he had charged on her account to the tune of $5,000. Within minutes, I had an electronic confirmation of the change in her account. Not bad, for 10 minutes of work. I then began to restructure her portfolio, dumping some real loser stocks and reinvesting into some blue chip stocks. The remainder I put into aggressive, volatile stocks which would require constant monitoring but handled properly would give her a great return. Even better, I would not be charging her a broker fee on any of the transactions. By the end of the day's trading, I was pleased by what I performed. I went next door for supper with a happy heart. When I began to broach the subject to Jeannie, she stopped me and told me she trusted me and I needn't worry about giving a daily account. So I continued trading on her account and getting to see her every night. Weekends were now spent showing her and the kids around the city instead of home projects. Well, that wasn't entirely correct, I was helping Jeannie at her house. Her house was in the same state of disrepair as mine had been in once I started. So my expertise came in handy as we would discuss a problem, I would offer a number of solutions, and Jeannie would decide. Jeannie also decided at what pace our relationship progressed. Our good night kiss soon became make-out sessions once the kids were asleep. She only allowed me to get to second base, because she felt uncomfortable doing anything while the kids were asleep upstairs. But just to hold that wonderful body next to mine was enough for me even if I went home every night with blue balls. Then, Jeannie's brother, Ray, and his family arrived with her car. We grilled steaks as he, and I got acquainted. I could tell Jeannie would be asking him what he thought of me, and I wanted it to be an honest opinion, so I didn't try any pretense with him. Ray, I'm just going to put this out there for you. I'm in love with Jeannie, and I intend to marry her whenever she is ready. She is the best thing that ever happened to me and I treasure every moment I'm with her. I know she values your opinion and I realize we just met and you don't know me that well yet. But give me time and I'll prove to you how much I care for her. Mark, I know from the first day you met that you have been there for Jeannie and the kids. She cares very much for you and I think the two of you belong together. But understand if you ever hurt her like that son of a witch did, then you and I will be having a very unpleasant meeting. With that we clicked beer bottles and brought the steaks inside. After the meal, Billy and Kay took their cousins upstairs as Jeannie and I talked with Ray and his wife. Our talk got to the point where Ray and Jeannie began talking about embarrassing moments from their childhood. Jeannie would scream in jovial protest as Ray continued all night. Finally, Ray looked at his wife and said, Honey, let's get the children to bed and then get to sleep in Jeannie's room. With that implication hanging in the air, we all said our goodnights. Without a word, Jeannie and I held hands as we walked into my house to my bedroom. We had wild and amazing sex of my life. I have no idea how long we continued to caress each other in the afterglow, but soon, we came to the mutual discovery that our physical efforts had gotten us both hungry as we laughed and rose from the bed. I put on my shorts and reached for my t-shirt when Jeannie told me that was what she was wearing. I was ready to ravish her again as she draped her newfound gown impishly on her body and we went downstairs. As we raided the refrigerator, I was pleased to see that our conversation was relaxed and easy as we made our transition from neighbors to friends to lovers. Every glimpse I caught of her at the kitchen table had me desiring her more. She was sitting with her bare feet propped against the edge of the seat, still draped in just my t-shirt. I gathered her in my arms and carried her upstairs. I placed her on my bed again as I looked in amazement at my woman. At that moment, I realized I would do anything for her. I would protect her with all my might, and I would not allow anything or anyone to come between us. It was that moment of serendipity that made me realize the difference in Denise and Jeannie. My time for mourning the past and working nonstop was over. Now was the time to start living again. I cradled against Jeannie, and she placed my arm over her to protect her against the night. I think we both knew we would be in a delightful wake-up in the morning. I kissed her goodnight, and soon we slept. 
Months passed by until one afternoon the front doorbell rang. Much to my surprise, there stood Denise and her lover, Paul Starling, with Susan and Brian in tow. I suppose I should have expected it since word had gotten to me that they were back in town. Denise said she had a proposition for me and asked if we could talk. I closed the door behind me and waited. I think it unsettled them that I did not invite them inside. I waited for someone to speak since I had nothing to say to them. Denise recovered from my rudeness and began speaking. She told me that she had handled our entire situation all wrong and she wanted to make amends. It turned out that Paul was the fraternity boy that her sorority had set her up with all those years ago. We had been rivals even though we had never met. Denise had continued seeing him and that it had been a 50-50 proposition that either of us had impregnated her. Denise had chosen me and expected to live her life with me. Then in law school, much to her surprise, Paul was one of her classmates. He continued to pursue her and she resisted as long as she could, but finally she succumbed to his charm again as they rekindled their affair. When Denise graduated and we had moved to Dallas, she had expected that to be the end of it. After our move to Atlanta and her transfer to Chicago, she had discovered Paul working at another firm. One thing led to another and she once again was in his arms. At his insistence, she had the kids tested and they both came back to being Paul's progeny. Surely, I could understand the kids' desires to be reunited with their biological father. I continued to hold my temper and biting my tongue as Denise continued. Since I had hit a wall career-wise, it was incumbent on Denise to do what was best for the family and that meant divorcing me and to get as much as she could for her children. That was why she had insisted on half the proceeds from the marital house, even though I had made all the payments. Now to the crux of the matter. The family was moving back to Atlanta in anticipation of her upcoming promotion to partnership. Word had spread as far as Chicago as to the recent gentrification of my grandmother's old neighborhood. Everyone was seeking to buy and restore all the old mansions to their former glory. Denise knew that I was unemployed from the brokerage firm since the divorce and could not afford to give my grandmother's house the attention it needed. She proposed that she would sign over the marital home to me and to pay off the mortgage. In addition, she had a cashier check in the amount of $100,000. All I had to do was to sign over the deed to my grandmother's house and I would be even with her. I continued to stare at her as she brandished the check. Slowly her arm came down as I continued to remain quiet. I softly invited them to come inside and I thought I saw traces of victory smiles on all their faces. As they entered, I was pleased to hear the surprised gasps as they looked at the foyer, lit by the large crystal chandelier. I began to explain in detail what efforts I had undertaken to bring the entrance way back to its glory. From there, I led them into the drawing room, where the exquisite details of the room were matched by the expensive, tasteful furniture. I continued to lecture them on my efforts of each room as they looked in amazement to the rich transition of my home. The conservatory drew gasps from Susan as she saw the Steinway grand piano featured in the room. She had always expressed an interest in music, and the best I could afford her as a child was an electric keyboard. She sadly traced her fingers alongside it as we went to the next room. Then we went upstairs to the large, comfortable bedrooms, ending up in the master bedroom with the warm, natural light bathing it glory, the master's bath, including a walk-in shower with multiple shower heads and the large re-enameled clawfoot bathtub gilded in gold leaf. I led them out the balcony, overlooking the Olympic-sized pool, complete with a pool house and a hot tub on the patio deck. I continued to lead them through each room until finally we wound up in my study. I explained about the mahogany paneling and my efforts to find the suitable furnishings to complement the decor. I pointed out all the expensive first editions books lined in the built-in bookcases as my pet golden retriever. Butters padded up to me and sat by me on my sofa. Denise looked on in distaste as she had always hated dogs. As you could imagine, I didn't really care what she liked anymore. Now, having taken the tour, do you really think I would be interested in moving back into that hellhole that only caused me misery? Before anyone could answer, two whirlwinds came and launched themselves into my lap. Daddy, we're back from the aquarium. Billy shouted. That's aquarium. Kay corrected him. Billy lost no steam as he, and then Kay began describing their trip to the Atlanta aquarium. They went on describing what they saw, and then Billy told me, but, Daddy, our aquarium is better. To which Kay agreed that our basement wall aquarium that I built for them was much better. Denise had been startled and surprised at the interruption. I gave her no explanation as Jeannie waddled in seven months pregnant. Oh honey, I didn't know you had guests. I quickly went to her side and asked how she felt as I guided her into a chair. I was rewarded with a gratifying smile as she kissed me. I announced, they aren't guests and they're just leaving. I led them outside and told them to never come back. 
As they drove off, I knew they had a million questions and they would never find out the answer to any of them. Like, how I immediately moved out of the house after I had gotten back from Chicago back into my grandmother's house. Once I had gotten in there, I realized the quality structure of the house was still sound and I could restore it by myself for the most part. Eventually, it turned into part of my therapy. The other part of my therapy was at work. After all the years at the brokerage firms, I had learned of the countless ways a broker could circumvent the firm's safeguards and put it at risk. Even though, technically, I was supposed to clear all transactions with my superior, I pretty well had carte blanche to do trading, since my reputation was of a cautious surefire trader. But when I got back from Chicago, I had opened an account in a fictitious business account, and using funds from the firm I began an avalanche of trading. By day's end, I had several thousand dollars profit into the account and replaced every dollar into the firm's coffers. I then erased the transactions out of the firm's computers, so no records remained and I was off and running. I know what I did was illegal, but I reconciled myself with knowing how much I had earned for everybody I had worked for over the years. I was satisfied with one day's payback. The next day, I began aggressively trading again and was up $10,000 by the close of trading. That pattern continued all week as I doubled or tripled my money. When I had close to $200,000, I took a short position on some top heavy tech stocks. I had timed it just right as I rang up 600% profits on each one, without having to respond to a margin call. Now, I was worth more than a million. Then my superior came sniffing around. The same man who had given me that damning review now insisted I hand over the account to him. I made a couple of keystrokes cashing in the account to an offshore account and turned to him and told him to go screw himself and quit on the spot. Since that time, I had continued my run until I was quite wealthy. That was why I had no objection to signing Denise's property settlement agreement. In her rush to protect her assets, she had neglected to see if I had any. And they continued to grow aggressively until I met Jeannie and realized I had a chance at starting over. When I married Jeannie, I finally revealed how much was in her account. She almost fainted at the mention of $2 million. Well, actually, she almost fainted when I told her I was worth just north of $400 million. Then, I made her aware that I owned every house in a block area around our houses. Her house had been the only house I had been unable to purchase, and it turned out to be the best investment I ever did not make. One last thing Denise would never know is how wealth correlated to power. That much wealth required a lot of legal oversight, a good portion of which I retained Denise's firm to oversee even though she was unaware of it. I had made it known to enough of the senior partners of how unhappy I would be if Denise made partner. That is, if she still had a law license. You see, Denise and Paul had gone to the bank which held the mortgage on our marital home and they had forged my name on the paperwork for a second mortgage. So they would have the funds for the cashier check they had tried to entice me with and saddle me with the second mortgage. Too bad. They didn't know I also owned the bank and had orders to be personally notified if anything flagged that account. Now, my good friend the district attorney, whom I had endorsed in the last election, would be filing forgery charges on Denise and Paul. Furthermore, he assured me he would lead the way to see that they both were disbarred from the practice of law. I casually wondered as I hung up the phone from speaking to him, whether Denise would represent herself or have a public defender at her trial. She wouldn't have much left after the announcement of the Low Income Section 8 Housing Development Project next to my good friends of the Home Owners Association came out. A contracting firm owned by my conglomerate would be building the project that would nosedive the property values of the homeowners. Since I had purchased the land to donate as a tax break on some of my annual profit, it all tied in. As I sat by my darling wife and propped her feet into my lap and gently massaged her feet as our children, whom I had adopted watched TV with their cousins who moved into Jeannie's old house which she had given to her brother. The contented sighs from her pleased me as I got a smile from her. It was the smile I got when I was in for a special night. Of course, every night with Jeannie was a special night as I smiled back and continued to rub her feet. Dear listeners, please share your thoughts in the comment section below and don't forget to like, share and subscribe.